Good afternoon. A Brief History is a big book, not just in terms of size, <laughs> but scope. It covers a massive swath of time, multiple countries and cities, this dimension, the afterlife, and 75 characters, many of whom have significant things to say, even if they're not narrators. But the narrators do. There are 10 of them, 12 if you count Kim Clark and Dorcas Palmer, the alter <laughs> egos of Nina Burgess, who also becomes Millicent Sigri in the novel's 12th chapter coda. At the center of the novel, though, is the 1976 attempt on the life of Bob Marley, referred to throughout as the singer, and its personal and political reasonings and ramifications. It is not an easy book, but it is a fantastic book. Welcome to the work of Marlon James. Thank you. I want to <laughs> begin by asking about your first book, mm -hmm. John Crow's Devil, which, as I understand, almost did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to imagine that maybe if that didn't happen, then maybe this book <laughs> doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, in acting, it is said that the actor must annihilate himself. And I keep thinking about the story I've read of you going to your friends' houses and deleting mm -hmm. the script of that book off of their hard drives. To what extent, if any, did this desperation make you the writer who wrote Seven Killings or make you a better writer? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. You know, I think uh, the, the... I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, the, that back then, I was such a different kind, a different kind of writer. I think... Um, um, and, and, and none of all the rejection is necessarily publishing's fault. I had this idea. I was going to write a book um, the biggest publisher in the world was going to publish it. Oprah was going to call. <laughs> I would say no first. <laughs> the second time she called, I'd accept it. And, and, and you know, it's sort of very um, naive idea about writing and about fiction and about the industry. Mm -hmm. and, um, and funny enough, I actually think I was more of a crowd pleaser then, which is why it disappointed me so much that nobody wanted it. I'm like... You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm selling something, please buy it. Right. Whereas with this one, and it may have come from having written two books before it, but this one was, was kind of my, my um, you know, Chimamanda Adichie talks about her FU book. Right. Um, not in that she's telling the reader FU, but that it was a book where I sort of let go of all of what I think a book should be, of what a novel should be, because... Um, the last novel I wrote was still a pretty, had a, still a pretty classic idea of what a novel, mm -hmm. what a novel should be. In that way, it's actually a pretty conservative book. Right. Whereas this, you know, I think sometimes there is a work of, of literature or art or poetry that's in your head, and a whole series of non-literary things mess it up before it gets done on the page, right. including your worry about audience expectation, yep. Um, where if you communicate it co correctly, whatever, all these sort of different things, should I speak in patois, mm -hmm. all these things that kind of lay weighted between here and page. And this was the first um, novel where I said, you know what, screw that. I want the novel in my head to be the novel on the page. Right. And, um, and I think going through... Uh, I mean, what's the worst is going to happen to me? Rejection? Right, <laughs> like, right. I already right. got 78 of those. Right. Uh, right. So that didn't, it really didn't scare me. Right. So, you know, with that first book, therefore, there, there, was, there was a point at which you were um, not a writer, and mm -hmm. then you're a writer. And then now you have the book and someone has accepted it and you're, you, you've, you, you're kind of running towards this life as a writer. Right. What would you say the three things, uh, if there are three, it mm -hmm. might be five, right, um, that you had to do to move from that place of non-writer mm -hmm. to writer? That's a good question. I think the first, I didn't do so much as it happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, even after the first novel, if you were to ask me the question, if you couldn't be a writer, what would you be? I would have an answer. Right. And by the time I got to my second novel, I was out of answers. Mm. So if you ask me if I couldn't write tomorrow, what would I do? I, I have no answer for you. Right. I, I don't know. Right. Um, there's this. It's only this. Right. Um, and I think that was one. I think I also realized and uh, that 
there is a, there is a, a life I had in Jamaica, and there's a life I wanted, and that I could write my way to it. Right. And I didn't right. think to go from a point where writing is something that you don't even think of can be something any form of sustainable, even artistically sustainable, in Jamaica, mm -hmm. to the point where I'm realizing, you know what, this th this head and this laptop is going to take me to this job, is going to take me to this life, is going to take me to this book deal, that um that I could literally write my way right. to another reality was something, you know, that was also something, else, something that I learned. Right. Um, I would say the third thing I learned was to get the hell out of the way. Right. Because, you know, I'm a pretty opinionated guy, and I, and I, and I sometimes would spill over into my writing. And the one thing, the one thing that isn't totally gone, but is kind of missing from this book is my own voice. Because I have the least interesting thing to say out all, in all my books. And mm -hmm. um, so to, to throw a novel, to throw a story to the characters mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. my ego out of the way, that was a big, that's a big thing because I'm pretty in love with my ego. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And, and, and to get that out of the way because it just, it just didn't serve any purpose in that, in, in that mm -hmm. book. Right. So, so you talk about not being able necessarily in the past to see that sort of life mm -hmm. as a writer, as a, as, a, as a Jamaican man, as a black Jamaican man. Mm -hmm. um, as a fellow West Indian, I am fascinated yeah. by the vagaries of class and the way they play out mm -hmm. in Jamaica. They, they operate somewhat differently in Trinidad, mm -hmm. uh, though there are some similarities. To what extent would you say that class, as you understand it, has informed that life as a writer and your, your ability to choose mm. that life at all? Um, a good example of, of my opinion, to, uh, my, my um, reaction to class would be Nina Burgess's reaction to class in the book. Mm. Whereas I was educated, I went to a posh school, I had all these trappings of the upper class, but I didn't have the money. Right. Um, so that, that, you know, that leads to this kind of conflict and this sort of resentment, because there is a class problem and there's a race problem in Jamaica mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the writing as a way of skewering it and writing as a way of moving beyond it mm -hmm. um, to the point where, you know, people say, you're so uptown now. I'm like, uptown wish there were me, people. <laughs> it's like this sort of, because it, 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 it can be, there is, an, uh, there, there is uh, one of the things I find, even going back to Jamaica, is that there, there's still certain circles and certain parties that if I am there, somebody with my skin color, I must be an entertainer. Right, right. And I won't lie, sometimes I'll play. Because they'll go, you look like you might be famous. I don't know who you are, but I won't offend you just in case you come on Oprah. Right, right, uh, right. Uh, but it's, 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 if, if anything, I get to sort of tear open the hypocrisy right. um, of class. And, uh, and, and in Jamaica, we like to say it's not, it's not race, it's class. And if it's only just class, then that's the most amazing series of coincidences I've ever seen right, in my life. Right, right, right. It's like, because I'm at this party and everybody else, my skin color, are sleeping with the Irish employees. Right. So, not me. <laughs> um, so, it's, 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 it, you know, it's, it's still there. And you, you do get the sort of, you do get the sort of artist pass. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what the hell you do. Right. But you're at that party anyway, and they go, and what do you do? Right, right. I just go, I'm a nuclear scientist. Right, right. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, I think in some way that that connects to one of the technical aspects that of, of, of this novel that mm -hmm. I want to examine. Um, so there are, so I felt like the story was, like the 10 narrators, like uh, they were in the room with you telling the story at the same time. And mm -hmm. they're, they're butting in and they're interrupting and they're contradicting one another and so mm -hmm. on. And every now and then somebody else pokes his head in the room and says, nah, it's not so it go. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, so talk about fragmentation, mm -hmm. non-linearity in your work in the contemporary West Indian novel. Right. Any relationship to song structure in reggae music? Because I read, for instance, where you, you talked about listening to the mu music of Augustus Pablo mm -hmm. for a long stretch of your writing of yeah. this book. Um, fragment, that, that was, again, part of breaking what I thought was a very classic idea of the novel. Mm -hmm. um, 
The very first word, the very first paragraph that I wrote in this book is now on page 458. Yeah. Um, to give you an example of how fragmented this, this novel is, because I realize if, if you're going to tell a story about a Caribbean reality, you can't tell it linear. Right. You can't yeah. tell it because there's a, there's a beginning, there's the false beginning, there's a true beginning, there's a beginning you thought was a truth, but it's right. not. And that's not how we talk. That's not how we talk. Yeah. Um, if, if, if you go, uh, part of it is part of even the African tradition, mm -hmm. where there'll be 365 days of the week, and they tell you the same year, and they tell you the same story every day, but it's different. Mm -hmm. And then a Western thing would be, but what's the true story? I'm like, but that's not how we do it. It's, right. Every story is a true story. Right. So part of it was connecting with that, that there is, I couldn't tell the story from the beginning because there kind of is no beginning. Right. And, uh, and if you notice, if you get to the end of the novel, the novel doesn't end, it stops. Because mm -hmm. there's no mm -hmm. ending either. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And, um, mm -hmm. and characters go around and they say the same things and they look at the same picture in a different way. Mm -hmm. They revisit, they, um, they say things that are contradictory. Mm -hmm. Weeper's narrative of his life is totally different from Tristan Phillips' narrative of Weeper. Right. And, and so on. Because it's, if... The, the, when you're talking about the Caribbean, you're talking about Jamaica in 1976, it's such a crazy, convoluted, creative, beautiful, dangerous, horrible year right. that there can never be one narrative. And one of the things that frustrated me writing this novel for the first two years of writing this novel is I kept imposing that type of structure and linearity on it, because that's all I wrote my, wrote my last novel. Right, right. And it just wasn't that's happening. I just could not tell it that way. Right. Actually, some, so some characters I wrote before others. Um, Weeper, even though he appears in the very first section, is one of the last characters I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, John John Kay, who's a hitman, who has mm -hmm. nothing to do with Jamaica, is the first character I wrote. Mm -hmm. And I realized, as long as I knew what the central event was, the Marley shooting in 1976, I could go all over the place with it. Right. And not just in terms of structure, but also in terms of form. Right. Um, to, again, the messing with linearity, the, the actual assassination scene was written in a kind of blank verse, mm -hmm. a kind of broken, you know, certainly mm -hmm. broken narrative, because mm -hmm. that's the only way you can capture the rhythm right. of something that right. frenetic, right. and it's followed by like a nine-page sentence. Right. Because if you're right. going to get the rush of people running away, high on cocaine, right. trying to escape something, and not even yeah. know what they're doing. Yeah, bam-bam bam section in that yeah. like, blew my mind, yeah. It's, 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 again, it's the novel that was in my head, and the novel that's in my head is never linear. Because mm -hmm. memory doesn't work that way, dreams don't work that way, imagination doesn't work that way. Right. And I wanted to get all of that down. And the only way I got through it was I said, you know what, I'll leave it until my editor takes it out. Right. <laughs> and he didn't take out anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just, um, it's the Caribbean, man. You can't, yeah. you can't, you can't write, you can't, we can't tell our stories that way. Right. And we, 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 we always go in different directions. We never have a beginning or an end. We use lots of repetition. We sometimes say, we use words just for the sound of it. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, 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 a it's, it's almost, it's not anti-narrative. It's just that there are different ways of telling, of telling that story. Right. I feel I, like I only answered part one of that question. No, no, that's, that's good. <laughs> Are you a sports fan? Did you grow up as a sports fan? I didn't grow up, no, I grew up as a total nerd. Okay. As okay. I, 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 what sports did I play? I used to play cricket, but I hated it. Okay. But I could play it. Right. And I was good at track, because I'm Jamaican and I'm part of the Jamaican <laughs> cliche. So yes, I was good at track. You know, I start to ask that because, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the book kind of uh, speaks about every aspect of Jamaican life mm -hmm. and political reality that could be brought to bear on the events of 1976. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, we know 1976 is, is also a crucial time in cricket for, we for the West Indian psyche. Mm -hmm. And um, in Jamaica in particular, I imagine that that must have also had a bearing. But in this particular novel, mm -hmm. that's not in there. What's your, what's your sense of... Uh, what, if anything, that particular time, that particular euphoria in mm -hmm. West Indies cricket had, had to do with those events as well? I think it, what it had to do with those events is that it's one of the few things we had to celebrate. Right. Certainly, if you're talking about Caribbean or Jamaican or anything, 
that so excellent that it explodes on a world stage, you're talking cricket and reggae. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, 1976 was what, 14 years after independence, mm -hmm. and most people are thinking we were better off as a colony. Right. Um, right. uh, that the, the, in the, the grand independence experiment had failed. It wasn't right. even 20 years yet. Right, right. And, and I mean, with reason, you know, um, polit the political upheavals were terrible. Um, you know, food was scarce. There's a fear that we're going to become communist. That the, the, the latching on of something to be proud of was really, really all we have. It's funny, it's a good parallel to know because there's so much great art and writing and so on coming out to Jamaica and the Caribbean, the sportsmen are doing well, and the politics are still shit. Right. Uh, right. It's, 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 um, it's the same thing over and over. And, and, and when mm -hmm. we who are not in the Caribbean go back, we go back to, when I go back to Jamaica, there's a sense that's exactly as I left it, mm. in both good and bad ways. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, as you begin the book, it takes very little time to realize that the singer to whom you refer is Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. Identifying him as a singer puts, him at a, puts us at a remove and kind of further mystifies him in my right. experience. Talk about the decision to identify him thusly. Um, <clears throat> that was easy because the, 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 everything that you said a while ago is everybody's experience of Marley. Mm. That, was, that was the Marley I know. Marley to me was not a physical person because I never met him. I never right. heard his voice. I never touched him or anything. Right. Marley, to me, in the 70s, was a series of news reports. Right. So Marley being famous was a news report of Marley being famous. Marley being shot was a news report of Marley being shot. Marley going through cancer treatment was a news report. This cancer, success, this cancer treatment of success was a news report. No, it wasn't a success. News report. We're going to take him to Germany, see what we can do. That's a news report. His drugs, everything, all the aspects of it are stuff I heard from a commentator telling me right. until he says that Bob Marley was pronounced dead. So, so. so his, the entire arc of his life are a series of 10-second sound bursts for me. Right. And for most people, it's that. Marley is the person who you heard about on the radio, the person you see on TV. Um, there was no MTV back then, so maybe the person you saw at a concert. But Marley, even back then, was almost more symbol than person. Wow, even then, even, even while then, he was alive. Even while I was alive, wow. he was more symbol. That, I think that means he's, just means he's a megastar. Right. But he was all, already more symbol than person. The other thing about Marley, the, there's a character in my book who's a ghost, Arthur Jennings. Right. And uh, it's funny, Arthur Jennings is based on a, on a specific person in Jamaica. Right. And I met that person's grand grandnephew, and he said, "I know who I know who this is." And you know, I, I actually started crying when I realized you're talking about my granduncle, because right. there's this guy in Jamaica named Ken Jones, who a lot of people thought was like our Kennedy. Right. And the dangerous thing, and the, the not dangerous, I hate that word. The the threat. That's a threatening thing about Ken Jones. Was Ken Jones was a unifier. Mm. People on both sides of the spectrum. Everybody adored him. People on the PNP, people on the JLP. He was a unifier. Next we know he fell off this balcony because he was sleepwalking. <laughs> Despite no history of that of sort of thing. So yeah. even his, his so it was kind of, it was kind of really beautiful and kind of chilling me talking to the grand, the grand nephew. Right. He says, and yes, everybody in the family knows he was pushed. Right. But nobody did anything. Right. Right. The reason why I brought him up is that the thing he has in common with Marley is Marley was also a unifier. A unifier and yes. not in some abstract lovey-dovey sense, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. that if you grow up, like for example, a good example, in my grandmother's house, there are, painting, there are pictures of, of the Michael Manley and Norman Manley. There are no pictures of family. Mm. So <laughs> when you, the, the idea of getting Jamaicans to think for themselves to actually demand more of their politicians, to actually think that politicians are only serving themselves and not them, is breaking, you're breaking almost a religion. Right. Because that's not how life is in, in, in ghetto areas. Life is you suffer, your party comes in power, maybe you'll get a, 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 a garbage cleaning job at Christmas. In two years, Uncle Ben's rice will show up at your door and some corned beef maybe. And you go, to, you go and vote for this party. And the next, if a neighborhood is acting up, you get guns and kill them. 
and it's all in service to these party members who you only see during election time. Right. So for a man to come, and especially speaking their voice, not the party's voice, you know, never met politician do you a favor, they'll want to control you forever. Right. Sick and tired of the ism, schism, get up, stand up, stand up for your right. rights. Right. That is flipping dangerous. That Absolutely. is, you're, you're completely obliterating a status quo that has existed since post-slavery. Right. So like he's interrupting an ecology. Is he interrupting? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really, I don't think people get how, it's hard here because here Bob Marley is what every frat boy listens to in their dorm room. <laughs> right. And it's three little birds. I was in a taxi and this guy was like, man, I wish we could get back to Marley and the peace and love vibes. I'm like, dude, Marley wasn't about peace and love. Marley was about revolution. Yep. He was like, well, if you say so. <laughs> was like, but yeah, so, so you get somebody who's doing that. It's, it's, the only thing I can compare it to is when Fela released Zombie. Yes, yes. And people realized that he was actually criticizing the soldiers and right, the military. Right. It's, it's um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was so, it was such a galvanizing, liberating moment, and they had to get rid of him. Right. Another character I want to talk about mm -hmm. is Luis Hernan Rodrigo de las Casas. <laughs> He's uh, kind of the flip image, as far as I can tell, or image in negative of Che Guevara. Mm -hmm. So, so Che Even goes... Even tried to kill him. So, right. <laughs> so Che goes to places to foment revolution, and Dr. Love goes to Jamaica to foment counter-revolution. Mm -hmm. Quote, because counter-revolution is an act of love, hermano, not war. Tell me how you decided on him as a character. Did you invent him? Did you composite him? Did you want him there as some kind of symbolic, mm. oracular talisman? Kind of all of the above. Mm. Um, I realized when I was telling a story about Marley assassination, I was going to tell a story about politics. If you're going to tell a story about politics, you're going to tell a story about the Cold War. Because mm -hmm. Jamaica yeah. entered the Cold War. Yes. People thought we were becoming communists. And right. what happens is a lot of the usual suspects then show up in Jamaica. The mm -hmm. Paraguay people, the Ecuador people, the mm -hmm. Nicaragua, who, the people who went on to Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. um, the Congo people. Right. The same names, the same CIA people, the mm -hmm. same NSA people. None of us trying to turn into conspiracy theories, but <laughs> right. that's just how it is. Right. And uh, to the point where even Jamaicans knew. I mean, when Bob Marley said Rasta don't work for the CIA, he wasn't, stri he wasn't stri striving for a metaphor. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the idea of, the, I mean, back then, just the hint of, of socialism. And those are, I mean, look at the Bernie Sanders thing. <laughs> now, the, the, the terrible S word. Right. And when Manley said, we're going to pursue a policy of democratic socialism, I mean, every single Cold War bell went off. Right. So right. next thing you know, Henry Kissinger is in Jamaica early, 1976. Yeah. And then a whole series of, of strange and ridiculous things happen. But he's a composite of real people. That um, people who you'd have seen in Jamaica, people who you'd have seen in, in Dominican Republic, people right. you have seen in Haiti right. because of, of, of US foreign policy. Right, right. It's funny that they aren't Americans, though. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So you have all these Hispanic and Latinos pushing American foreign policy. Right. Yeah. School of the Americas. School of the Americas and all of that, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm a poet, and the persona form is mm -hmm. fraught with potential for madness of all kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? How do you manage to not only write an entire novel in that form, but in, in several personas whom you allow to, uh, you know, for myself, mm -hmm. I feel as though to do it successfully, I have to let that persona speak through me. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself speaking through the persona, the persona speaking through you? What, is, what, did, what, what was it like to switch back and forth between these mm -hmm. people? I think it was more the persona speaking through me rather than me speaking, speaking through them. Other than every now and then I'll say something, you know, Nina will say something that, I, that, that was actually me. Right. Um, on, a, on a very, very technical level, I did one voice a day. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't inhabit more than one character. Because I really wasn't just writing them, I was just like, for the most part, I was just sitting in a space, okay. Is what, it, it, the plot was there, but like, how do they eat a sandwich? Is it fussy? Do they stick their pinky out? And so on. So, so, so uh, that was one thing, spending, writing one character, mm -hmm. one character a day. Um, but I also did a lot of things like plot charts where I'll have it up on the wall, 
it'd be char- each column is a character, each row is a time of day. Ah. Because I just need to know where everybody was at all times. Right. So I know uh, Nina is asleep, Josie's probably killing somebody, right. um, Alex is kidding himself, somebody, you know, and, and, and <coughs> so I could keep, one, keep track of them, and two, not play favorites. Right. Because if it was left up to me, this would be a 600-page novel about a sexually conflicted gay hitman with boyfriend trouble. Right, right, right. <laughs> Not to say he was my favorite character, but I did start with him first. Right. Um, yeah, and it's... it's but, uh, yeah, inhabiting characters can also carry its weight of, of trauma to it, especially right. when it's not a nice character. Right, right. Um, when, you know, some of my characters do really terrible things. Right. And, um, and I, the, the important thing there was to never fall into a, a, a situation where I justify it. Because I think that's kind of pathetic. Right. Um, and I didn't want, I didn't want a, 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 a mix of misunderstood villains. No, these are terrible people. Right. Uh, I, I said to my students, you know, sometimes range means bad to worse. <laughs> it doesn't right. necessarily mean good and bad. It can mean right. bad, worse, and even worse than that. Right. And, right. Um, and that was it. But, you know, I, there, I still have this kind of journalistic distance, and I think that's how I got into it finally, mm-hmm. where I sort of acted like I was just a reporter. Right. So I had no emotional stake in what they did, which is why they can end up doing a lot of things without right. me necessarily flinching right. at it. I had to become a kind of biographer. Right. In a way, a biographer, reporter. Um, a lot of the, some of it, some of the, some of the sections like Demos, they're literally ask, answering questions I threw at them. Right. And yeah, that's how I did it. Again, I had to, I had to come out of the book. Right. To, so, so further, uh, how, did that, how did that get even more complicated with Nina Burgess, mm-hmm. who becomes Kim Clark, who becomes Dorcas Palmer, who becomes Millicent Segree? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, I also recognize in her um, several iconof- iconographies of, of people whom I know, mm-hmm. right? Like, I feel even certainly more than Papa Lo or Josie Wales, mm-hmm. you know? So how did that work for her? Um, well, one, she was important because she's one of the, one of probably only two characters that make it to the end. Spoiler alert. Right. And, um, the, on, and the only woman. And the, the only woman right. who, who, who make, makes it to the end. Well, the only woman character, really. Right. Uh, but she's a survivor, and I, and I really wanted to show what it would take for a dis, a sort of a, 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 a a person whose life has been interrupted and disrupted, but, but survives. Um, but she, one, it was a lot of fun to write. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But also, I, I, I like the idea, I like the, I like the idea that Paula, Fox, the, that Paula Fox novel, Desperate Characters. And I like writing about what people do when they're in a desperate situation. Mm-hmm. And how that keeps multiplying. Nina is a very, very smart person, but she makes these terrible choices, mm-hmm. and um, and that to me was also fascinating. I, I, I like writing that characters who who make mistakes, who do make wrong turns, who do one simple thing and their big mm-hmm. their big consequences. Right. Um, but for a huge part, with her, more so than any other character, she's one character I didn't know where she was going to end up. Mm-hmm. I honestly didn't know. Um, right. Because the way, I read, the way I wrote her was almost kind of dismissive. Mm. Yeah, you're just another hangers-on. As soon as Marley enters out of the picture, leaves the picture, I won't have need for you as a character. Yeah. She was like, that's what you think. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be the first time characters have gone against my wishes. Um, my last car in, in Book of Night Woman, Nina was supposed to be there for six pages, and she right. took over 600 pages. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, I had no idea where she was going to go, because she's also not based on a real character. Right. The characters were based on real characters. That was easier. I know their trajectory. But she, I just, I just didn't know. Right. Um, so in, in, in part three, where she shows up under another name, it was almost a, kind of a shock to me as well. It just came to me. She's on a bus thinking this bus is going to blow up. And I'm like, hold on, you're back. Right, right. <laughs> Where have you been? And then it, it, you know, it comes up that way. And then um, in the 80s, she kind of just showed up again. up again. It's like, 
who is that mysterious nurse living in the Bronx? Right. By the way, my sister is a nurse living in the Bronx, and she tells everybody Nina is based on her. <laughs> She's like, come on, I'm a nurse who's Jamaican, and I live on really? Corsa Avenue yeah. in the Bronx. It's yeah. me. But there's 712 of them. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, in that way, though, uh, I, I feel as though Nina, if, if if anyone is a symbol of Jamaica itself, mm -hmm. that Nina is that person, right? Yeah. She, she, she absolutely changes the way she needs to to survive. Mm -hmm. At one point, she thinks Bob Marley is going to save her, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, like everything about the Jamaican, uh, about one way one could read the Jamaican ethos mm -hmm. is kind of represented in her. Yeah, she at some point realizes if anybody's gonna save her, she's gonna have to save herself. Right. Right. Because nobody, nobody is going to. Right. Although she keeps trying. And right. She tried for a good number of years. Uh, right, right. And um, yeah, and, and, and that is a kind of a, a Jamaican spirit when you, you realize, particularly with mothers, it's like, right. yeah, you know what? <laughs> Nobody's going to do this. <laughs> I better do it for myself. Right, right. Mm. In, a, in, in the interview with uh, Salman Rushdie, you say, I'm not in dialogue with Empire. Right. And... Uh, you know, among my uh, obsessions is this question of language versus dialect. The, right. the idea that um, we are not speaking a dialect, but we are actually, uh, and I think within the Caribbean, Jamaica, more than the rest of us, mm -hmm. is actually crafting its own, its own language. Tell me about how you, you, you solved the problem of the patois, mm -hmm. uh, how to write it, um, how to, to write it and make it accessible to, mm -hmm. to non-Jamaicans, all of that. Yeah. Um, actually, it was a fight. Mm. The, the, um, the novel before this, which is all Patois, and it's all slave Patois, it was the, the, the original version of it, a good 50, maybe 100 pages, is in Jane Austen Standard English. Right. And that's how I started writing it. Um, you know, I'm kind of a Jane Austen nut, so it's not easy. For, it's not hard for me to slip into that type of language, and um, it just started to feel really false. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't know if it, I can only speak for my generation, where I was still taught pato was something inferior. Pato is right. what you speak at your house and not to your mother. Right. Um, you know, it was ghetto talk, it was butto language, it was whatever. It was not the language of any form of art. Right. Despite the fact that by then, the most complicated stories were being told in reggae music. Right. Which, would, which was pretty much all pato. Right. Um, right. You know, the, 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 if you're going to use pato, you're doing something slapstick. You're ultimately laughing at the language. Right. Everybody who's speaking it is a buffoon. Is somebody dressed up in a wig? It's a man in in, in woman costume. It's it's whatever. Right. But it was something to laugh at, and it was the hard. It really was actually a lot harder than I thought it would have been to let go of all of that self prejudice. Right. And 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 one give the story to Lilith in the previous novel, mm -hmm. and to give the story to all these characters in this one, mm -hmm. it just wouldn't work otherwise. And I know because I tried otherwise. Right. Right. And um, so it, I learned it the hard way, actually, that, um, that I, I don't think a Bob Marley had to learn, that the right. voice that comes out of my mouth is legit for any form of art. Right. I, I had to learn that because that's right. not how I was taught. Right. Um, so, but to, to get to the point where I'm, I am using dialect, but not even in the cliche way, like nobody talks, I mean, one of the things I'm really happy is even though everybody talks about the dialect in this, nobody calls it lyrical. Right. Because I wasn't writing lyrical prose. I was writing, you know, functional, everyday speech, yes, nasty yes, prose, yes, raw prose. Yes. Because it's, I want the way in which people talk. Yeah. The other thing, though, with, with Patois is that there are also different variations of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to get into with this. That is not just a, a one note thing. Yes. That even within Patois, there are complexities and there, there, people say it differently. Nina Burgess doesn't sound like Weeper. Absolutely. Um, so even within, even within this sort of language, there are, there are languages. Right. And I wanted to capture, you know, I wanted to capture all of that. But first I had to learn to like it. Mm. I had to learn to, to love it and accept it. Um, you know, do I think Patois should be taught in a school curriculum as a language? Probably not. Not because I think it's, it's not worth it. Well, I think 
the patwa today is not going not going to be the patwa in ten years, and that's Absolutely. what's great about it. Right. Um, it's it's. Uh, it's our dialects that keep the English language alive. That's what gives it dynamism. Right. Um, you know, that's, what, um, th that's what keeps it fresh and going. Otherwise, you'd have no language. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it first I had to take ownership of it and get over my shame using it. Right. And this whole idea that Patois is broken English as if it needs to be fixed. Right. It don't need to be fixed. It's like right. Mervyn Morris said, is English we're speaking. Right. It, it, there, you know, there is no, nothing wrong with it. The funny, the irony, though, with this is that I've never had an issue with Americans over Patwa. I only have issues with Caribbean people, particularly the Jamaicans. Of course. I have never, no American ever said, even, yeah, they'll say it's kind of hard, but I get the rhythm after a few pages. Nothing wrong with that. Right. That's fine. Right. But they, why are you writing in this way? Why are you writing in Patwa? Aren't you an English teacher? Well, your mother pay a lot of money to send you to school true, for you true. to go on, right? <laughs> yeah, she, she pay a lot of money and she buy my nice Clarks shoes. Right, right, right. <laughs> and we talk, uh, talk, that's why I that was to go and shame the family. I'm telling you, that's <laughs> one of the funniest things for me, one of the in-jokes in this book for me, is how everybody keeps talking about how somebody else chat bad. Right, yes, yes, yes. And these people don't <laughs> chat good. Right. <laughs> but everybody's like, yeah, that person chat bad. You know, right. th there's a scene where, where Josie Wales slaps the living daylight out of his son. Yes. And so if it's one thing I can't stand is when people chat bad. Right. And then mm there's another scene Meanwhile, where... Meanwhile, he's killing every other person he's Oh, my God. And, and <laughs> he also is not a big fan of tense. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. He, doesn't know how to, he doesn't know plurals either. <laughs> right. But he, he thinks... Every, yeah, but he, th there's a scene in it where... Um, I think a CIA guy says, and also this about Josie Wales, he's really proud of how he speaks. Yes, yes. Although Josie Wales chat bad too. Yes. Yeah, we all chat bad, that's why I want to chat. Yeah. <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the really interesting uh, aspects of Josie Wales' character is the fact that he knows how to speak Spanish, mm -hmm. but, uh, but does not let anyone know because he wants it to be a kind of a trump card yeah. in terms of his uh, communication with Dr. Love. Mm -hmm. um, the... Talk about, a little bit about kind of Greek dramatic mm -hmm. iconography, Papalo versus Josie Wales, mm -hmm. et cetera. Like, um, to what extent was uh, uh, that sort of structure consciously present in your mm -hmm. head as you were writing? You're like the Did first you? person to ask me that. It's hugely nice. present. Ah. In fact, I'm reading the Oresteia right now. Ah, okay. I read Greek tragedy, Greek poetry before I write every book. Ah. Um, in my first novel, there was a Greek chorus who contradicted the narrator. Um, my second novel is a story about somebody telling a story. Right. And even in, 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 um, in Brief History, that's kind of the role the ghost plays. Right. He's right. sort of a plot summary guy. He, 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 he sort of um, yeah, puts everything together. Yeah, he's kind of chorus sometimes. He's kind of a chorus, but he's also, to jump from Greek to Roman, he's also a Cassandra. Right. Nobody right, listens right. to him. Right, right, right. Even right. though he's saying all these things. But um, the idea of a chorus taking a story along and sometimes even having, you know, having contradicting the, 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 the narrator, because again, the idea there is no authentic story. Yes. It's something that's very, very, very big to me. I always come back to it. Um, for, for, even for more than that, I, you know, I, I always read Greek tragedy, and I always go back to Greek tragedy, because I still maintain the ancient Greeks are the only people who had a realistic view of humanity. Mm. That the type of flaws a Greek tragic hero would have would horrify everybody else. It's all great that Hamlet delays, whoopee. Right. Uh, House Atreides et their children. Right. right. <laughs> and that's the hero. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We'd have to talk about what Oedipus got a lot. Got right, right, got right, right. <laughs> That these, these are these, I mean, spectacularly flawed characters. Right. And the ancient Greeks still see something good in them. And I write really, really damaged, flawed, violent, terrible right, characters. Right. But I still, it's still, still very important for me that when you, Josie Wales is gone, you miss him. Yes. And then you'll hate yourself for missing him, and I go, my work here is done. Right. Uh, 
but yeah, it's it's um I, that the idea of how to 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 um write the off stage event and the staged event, the intensity of emotion, the sometimes swinging into let's bring in the dreaded literate lyricism, right? But type of lyricism. I always go back to it. I'm about to write my next novel now, and that's why I'm reading the Oresteia, because it always sort of just re refreshes me, and then I go into it. Right. But yeah, you're the first person to pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> so last question before we turn it over mm -hmm. to you all. Uh, Seven Killings features several characters who represent the Lumpen class and those mm -hmm. folk whose bodies uphold the carceral state in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Um, the nature and justice of incarceration here has been recently put under a microscope like never before. Um, what do you see as the similarities and differences between that particular failure here and there in Jamaica and, and the wider Caribbean? Um, I'm not sure. It's funny you just, because, I mean, the David Cameron just made his little visit to Jamaica right, where he promised right. 25 million to build a prison right. so we can send all your British criminals right. back. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I don't know if, if, if the Jamaican prison system has become a point where it's just a commercial operation like here. Right. Where you can have things like that guy who basically framed people for years. Yeah. Uh, and I hope they let all those guys out. But, right. but in Jamaica, the, you know, the prison complex is not much removed from the slave, slave, the slave camp complex. It's not right. much removed from, from that type of... of um, sort of slave shackles, black hole of Calcutta. It's a very British colonial thing. Right. And this whole idea of justice should be punitive instead of, of rehabili rehabili rehabilitatory, rehabilitatory, whatever yeah, you pronounce yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is still there and it still, it still filters, I think, into, into the culture. Right. Um, I'm not sure how, when, how or when that, that's gonna evolve. Because if the 70s couldn't do it, <laughs> um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what will. Right. right. Mm. Uh, I think it's just about time for you all to, uh, you know, get your questions. Congratulations on your award. Oh, thank you. Um, what author are you reading now? Who am I reading? Now? Well, other than Aristea, uh, who am I reading now? I'm reading, uh, I'm reading Baldwin, actually. Because as it turned out, I've never read Another Country. Wow, look at the dead silence. I'm ashamed that I haven't read it. <laughs> God. So I'm reading Another Country, <laughs> and I'm reading um, Mary Beard has this new history of Rome called SPQR that I'm reading. It's already blowing my mind because that whole thing about in the gladiator pits where they, 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 they killed all these Christians didn't happen. Sorry. <laughs> ben Hur love was out there. Didn't happen. So I'm reading, I'm reading Baldwin and I'm reading History of Rome and, and some, Greek, some Greek tragedy. Yeah. Uh, thank you both so much for a really engaging conversation so far. Thank you. Um, Marlon, I wanted to ask you, uh, you said at the beginning of your remarks that uh, you consider yourself to be a pretty opinionated guy. Mm -hmm. And there's another Caribbean writer who shares a surname with you who I would describe as an opinionated guy, and I just wondered if there's, um, to what extent, if any, uh, C.L.R. James had uh, on you? Um, I mean, C.L.R. CL, James has had a, a huge effect on me from I was in college, from I was like 17. Um, the whole idea of a Caribbean sensibility, in fact, my, I, my idea of a black sensibility came from C.L.R. James, Amy Cesar, um, these guys, and, um, and yeah, and he is and he remains, he, I think he remains crucial. Um, I haven't read Minty Ali in a long time. I, wanna, I hope it holds up. But um, in terms of the idea that I could even have a sensibility, hmm. a lot of that was shaped by him. Because um, again, you know, I'm really proud for a lot of my education, but I really regret a lot of it as well, because one of the things it did do was erase me. Um, and which is which, it, it, which is why I still have a complicated relationship with a lot of my favorite books. I have a complicated relationship with Dickens, because I know when when um, Governor Eyre 
um, went through with extreme prejudice and slaughtered a bunch of Jamaicans who just wanted self-determination. Dickens was one of the people who was like, yeah, that's cool. So I have, a complicated relationship, I have a complicated relationship with all these people, but these are the people who I was given to read when I was growing up, and I still can talk volumes about great expectations. So the idea of, of even selfhood leading on to, to blackhood, leading on to nationhood, a lot of that was shaped by C.L.R. James and Amy Cesar and that whole, that whole generation. And I think it's, it's, we have a way of forgetting people because we think they've been superseded. You know, um, Einstein didn't make us stop reading Newton. But we keep thinking, well, Malcolm X means we should no longer read um, King, and Du Bois means we should no longer read Washington. No, they still all have to be read, and we should all, and, and they still have important things to tell us. Thank you for writing such a powerful novel. Thank you. My question is, with such a wide and varied cast of characters, do you ever plan to revisit some of them, maybe in short story form, or give them their own novel? Like A Funny Boy, for instance, I found <laughs> for such a short amount of time in the novel, he was so brutal and powerful. It's Thank funny, because A Funny Boy is actually based on a real person. And he's alive, so I'm not going to say who. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually... I'm more, the, the idea I had, and I may eventually do it, was actually not revisit the same characters, but revisit the same years. Mm. Like go, sorry, 76, 79, 85, 91, and pick a whole new 76 people. <laughs> um, particularly the Jamaican middle class. Because <laughs> I don't think that's written about much. And that's one of the reasons why Nina as a character happened because um, we don't talk about that much. But I, I'm very tempted to do that like every, every like 10 years. <laughs> just like pick, pick five years and 10 characters and just throw the years at them and see what happens. I like that, that the, the, the up series, seven up, 14 up. I, I like the idea of that. I'm not necessarily, as I said, I'm not necessarily want to revisit some of these characters again. For one, most of them are dead, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, but I, I, am, I am so, I'm, I'm almost more fascinated by the years. Um, 1985 was a really interesting year for me personally. So I'm really interested in, 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 in throwing another section of Jamaica and America and, and whatever and see how, how, what type of, how they went through those decades. Thank you very much for the book and congratulations. Thank you. Um, so I really enjoyed the way that you had a lot of um, Marley's lyrics um, interspersed mm -hmm. throughout the book, but I was curious if you could say something more about why you um, made Midnight Ravers the song that Nina Burgess identifies with. Um, because there are quite a few women in Jamaica who identify with Midnight Ravers, <laughs> and a lot of them claim it's about them, because Marley was a pretty legendary ladies' man. Uh, and I think, yeah, I mean, that's really the only reason. There is one person, I can't remember her name. She's like, no, I am the authentic Midnight Ravers woman. <laughs> and it's funny, because Midnight Ravers doesn't really talk about sex that much. In fact, you can't read it anyway. But uh, I, that one, because I know they're, they're, I've met a few of the, the women who are like, yeah, Midnight Ravers is about me. Then I think I'm writing them. I say, you know, I didn't do that. I was like, it's not about you. So <laughs> that's it, really. It's just, it's just one of those sort of Marley legends. One of the fun ones. Um, having lived through most of the novel, I yeah. grew up in 1970s Jamaica, just mm -hmm. like you did. And I know just how dangerous writing about politics in Jamaica can be. Mm -hmm. Have you had any repercussions? Anybody threatened you? Have you <laughs> I mean, we, well, know, I we know how petty they can be back Yeah, home, so. you know, I mean, you know, I don't check my voicemail, so maybe. <laughs> it's, it's, it's maybe, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I think winning this prize, it means a lot of Jamaicans are, Jamaicans are not going to actually read it. So who knows? Um, I don't know. I hope not. Because, one, because I think we're just so tired of being imprisoned by the past. One, it, it's really encouraging reading and, 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 and hearing from young people, young Jamaicans who read this book and kind of take ownership of it because they grew up in a culture where these are the things we don't talk about. They go, why? There's no reason why. If you want to talk about it, talk about it in your bedroom or on your veranda. 
And every Jamaican is totally explicit on their veranda. <laughs> but once we leave that, we go back to acting, you know, just sucking everything up. So I, hopefully that is, but I mean, you know, Jamaica is the way it is. Um, I'm supposed to be back there for Calabash, who knows, I might need security. <laughs> I hope not, but you know, it's like my mother will always say, pray to God, but lock your car. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, we, we, you know, we, we'll see. There's also on a very big level, a lot of Jamaicans think I'm a sort of a muckraker, muckraker, muckraker. They sort of thought some of the other book as well. So it, it'd be interesting because I don't write. I think they, a lot of Jamaicans love the idea of a successful Jamaican novelist. They just wish it wasn't me. <laughs> you know, because, you know, I write really raw books. There's rawness, there's sexuality, there's explicit violence, there's explicit sex. People chat bad. There is nothing, it's not about the, you know, the dignified country woman who thinks of the hereafter by the jacaranda tree. <laughs> As it's, don't get me wrong, there's some brilliant work written that way. But I just, I, yeah, I'm just not interested in that. I was, I mean, I was trying to write a crime novel. So, yeah, you know, but we'll see, <laughs> yeah. This will be our last question. Hi, my name is Stacy Gibson, that's my uncle. Um, <laughs> and so, um, as a Jamaican-born um, American raised, what I want to say to both of you, um, I've appreciated both of your work so much because in so many ways, what you're leaving for someone like me is blueprints mm -hmm. and all of the erasure. As somebody who's been educated here, I completely can understand what you talk about in terms of the erasure. So mm -hmm. thank you both mm -hmm. for your work, which continues to fill gaps, mm -hmm. but then also simultaneously explode the entire yeah. paradigm. So thank you. Well, thank that's you. what I think a lot of what I was doing. Uh, me, Roger, uh, Naomi Jackson's new book, The Star Side of Bur Bird Hill, um, Sharon Miller, Roland Watson Grant, Aishan Hutchinson, Kai Miller. Mm -hmm. One of the things we are doing is responding to the erasures. Because mm -hmm. we have so much of it to the point where we start doing it. Yeah. So a lot of that is reclaiming erased space. And we have a lot of work to do. That's why I'm saying we don't have time to worry about colonialism and we don't have time yeah. to worry about post-colonial and what Mother England. Mother England ain't my mother. Yeah. You know? <laughs> We, we got some, yeah, we got some untold and unspoken and some erased space to talk about. Mars. Yeah. yeah. And well, that's my rant. For well, the day. thank you so much. <laughs> Good. <That's my> <laughs> thank you.